So Lee, this is such an extraordinary opportunity for me, actually. Uh, we've, we've never done this before and uh, it's exciting. Thanks to coronavirus, we're doing this. <laughs> yes, and it's really lovely. And you know, I've always admired very much the trajectory of your life uh, because it's a fascinating, exciting, dramatic, challenging life that you've led. Not just your own life, but also the, the way that you've worked your way through music and all the aesthetic and moral challenges that you've been able to overcome in these years has resulted in the work that you've been doing in painting, installations and performances and so forth. And it's really a tour de force. You know, you, you started, Lee, as a young child, a little child, in the rigours of the Cultural Revolution. You then found a means, uh, because of your voice and because of your musical gifts, to be invited to the Army Operatic Orchestra, which gave you not only a sanctuary for your own personal development in one way, but also a platform for a, a new freedom on the other. So I didn't choose to be born in China and a few years before the Cultural Revolution, which is a dramatic period in Chinese history. The country was very much dedicated to performances because of course performance is the best tool for propaganda, everybody knows. So I spent a long time in my childhood dancing and singing in front of a Chairman Mao's portrait. So actually it gave me an early taste for, for music and I didn't uh, conceive the rest of my life without music. It was a platform in a way, was it for you to meet your husband who was a French diplomat in Beijing at the time? Actually 1978 is the beginning of the opening policy by Deng mm. Xiaoping and then they opened university again. I was among one of the soldiers who get out of the army as soon as possible to prepare the university. It's, it was a challenge. And then, yeah, I get into one of the universities, which is the University of International uh, Economic Relations and Trade. And I've got chance to practicing period in the cabinet of a ministry of, Minister of Foreign Trade. And that's the place where I met my, my future husband. Uh and it was so it was a courageous thing to do a dangerous thing uh, in a way for you to do as a chinese were you absolutely clear about your path to marry a foreigner to perhaps go abroad to back to paris in his case and take this huge risk leave this tremendous effort that you'd made behind you sometimes you just you you you, you follow you your feelings you, you, go you can Paris, you, you didn't speak French. You yeah, already were grappling with the moral and ethical uncertainties of political systems. You were, you were sceptical about communism. You were perhaps sceptical about liberal democracies in the West. And you decided, did you not, to try to learn about this, try to find a resolution for your uncertainties. Uh, by ap applying to the one of the toughest schools in the world, the Sciences Politique, Sciences Po. My question about liberal uh, democracy was, I mean, all the doubt and everything was coming later because uh, in China, since the opening policy, we do we do uh, get some um, um, classical, uh, philosoph philosophical, and, and political theories in some specialized book, library, bookshop. The most exciting period, of course, is the Enlightenment for us. It's against all, everything obscure. Sciences Po gave you this added background in terms of political economy and so forth. But then you went on and pursued your philosophical interests at the Sorbonne. I thought that a master's degree in college philosophy in Sorbonne would be more benefit for me to understand deeply or the philosophical background of a democracy. But, uh, but, and then I think you went on still on your quest to try to find some resolution to all your think thinking uh, by going to see whether art history could help you and you went to Italy. So, uh, my professional life actually started from, from there, from my first trip to, to Italy. And the, the cultural heritage there was a, such a shock, visual shock. From that point, I started to paint. Apart from my passion for ink drawings I, I do just in the casual way when I was small. I have received professional, I mean, education in uh, fine art in Italy, but in a very classical way. And of course, one day I realized that in Western history, oil painting has been down, explored in all directions. Basically, you have done everything. 
So to find another more, more personal artistic language, I have decided to incorporate ink into what I've learned both in Florence, in Venice and in London. Yes. You see, I think what's so fascinating for many critics and people who have admired your work in the last years is that you've had this cluster of conflicting experiences in your life. Traditional art versus avant-garde, East versus West, the old Chinese ways of doing things and the new. So many different things being absorbed by you, by your mind, both uh, intellectually and aesthetically. I wonder whether you didn't somehow find a way back to the central tenet of Chinese thought, which is the acceptance within Chinese philosophy of the reality that there are no final solutions to the mysteries of life. You, 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 you pointed out that there are one of the major points, the philosophical support of this kind of work, which is ink painting. Ink painting is basically water painting. How can you control water? Water, when it's getting very hot, it will become mist. And if the weather gets very cold, it will become frozen. So water is something fluid and so you have to have this a certain sort of a pragmatism i mean it's it's to adapt yourself to the situation do you also use in your paintings grit and sand and pigments which is very different it halts the progress of the ink and creates a density which is really the opposite to ink opposite to the fluidity and suppleness of ink there is one thing i really want to insist is that um by going back to ink painting um, mm. I'm not trying to define a cultural identity. My purpose is more insist in the, the meeting yes. of this traditional medium and all what I've learned in the West. What, is, what has come out of it all, it seems to me, it seems to other people who have uh, admired your art recently, is that you've managed to become really very avant-garde, very boundary-breaking uh, in doing what you're doing. Tell us a little bit more, because you've done so much in the last years, Lee. A lot of, yeah. You've done a lot of exhibitions in museums and in institutions, in monasteries, and uh, you've done a lot of performance work. You've been able to incorporate your interest in music and your understanding of music into these spectacles. T tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I had a great opportunity to get back to China following my husband in Beijing, so I spent the last almost nine years, starting from 2008 in China, and um, my resolution during this 10 year stay is to bring my work to the major uh, Chinese institutions. Like yes. The National Art Museum, Today Art Museum, Shanghai Art Museum. And the one that made me really feel proud is the, the solo show at the National Opera. So in, in Peking Opera is the first time that I presented uh, the huge installation called the Contable pour Archi. And so the, the, the violin solo of Paris Opera and also the conductor, Philip Jordan, they came to join me to conduct, conduct the National uh, Symphony Orchestra of Beijing. Uh, it was a great experience because music for me is like uh, my first love. I have just finished Art Paris, Art Paris, Art Fair, and uh, in this Art Fair, I present uh, a series of works dedicated to music to Debussy, to Chopin, to uh, Hakmaninov, and to a Japanese composer, Taki Mitsuk. 